the title of our message today is Overcoming Our Corruption. Now, I did not plan that, but guess what? There is something very powerful, and this message has zero to do with giving. So those of you that are hypersensitive towards giving, get over yourself and get your eyes back on Jesus and follow him. Be a follower of Christ. And so we are in James chapter 4, and what we're taking a look at here today uh, as we continue this study, well, uh, let's just remember this, is that we've learned that pra- practical Christian living at the crossroads of culture, that this is the core message of what James is dealing with. This is coming right here. This is his epistle. And, 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 and maybe it would be wise by me to remind you of something, that James, who is he? He's the half-brother of Jesus, right? We know that from the scriptures. But we also know this from the scriptures, that regarding uh, whether it's James or the other half-brothers of Jesus, we know that they were antagonistic and that they were critical towards the methods, towards the message, towards the miracles of Jesus. That that, that all of these particular things, you can take a look at the screen in John chapter 7, verse uh, 3 through 5. Take a look at this, I think. We're going to throw this up there. And Jesus' brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. Uh, You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Guess what? That's James. That's James. But after James saw the resurrected Christ, you want to see the other side? 1 Corinthians 15 and 7. Let's, let's see what this is, because I don't remember what this verse is. I don't even know if I showed you this verse. <laughs> I did. It says, after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Listen, after, after Jesus saw the resurrected Christ, he became a radical defender and a radical supporter of the faith. Now, my question is turning to you before we even get into the core of what this message is all about, is that have you seen the resurrected Christ? Have you seen the work of God within your life? Has, 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 has Jesus met you at the cross? Has he forgiven you personally of your sins? Has he taken away death and brought you into new life? Has he made you a new creation in himself? Has he done that in your life? Because if, if, if that has gone out, if you've responded to the, to the message of grace by faith, with your life, then you're a new creation, and and you, like James, and me, like James, we should be radical and passionately sold out to follow and to obey Jesus, because he's alive. And this is the message that we find that James gives, that that once the guy that was antagonistic, once the guy that questioned the methods and the miracles, and all of these things, once this guy that pushed back on his very own brother, who he knew for 30 years before before Jesus began his public ministry, right? Well, he's a younger brother, so maybe he didn't know him quite 30 years, but you understand what I'm saying. But in the middle of that household drama, man, while he gave Jesus so much pushback, there came that point where he saw the resurrected Christ and he realized, oh man, who am I before God? I'm undone. And James writes this no-nonsense book. He gives what you and I have as the epistle of James here, and we get a chance to see this. That as he shares how Christian living happens in a corrupt culture, and, 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 and quite frankly, guys, in this epistle, there's many times that James goes to that place and he refers to the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. He, he, he comes along by the work of the Holy Spirit and he supports the message that Christ has already given. That he, that he finds himself there in that place of, of there, there is a need for the body of Christ both then and now in 2020 to hear how it is that we live out our Christian living in a very practical way, to deal with the practical issues in a culture that is increasingly corrupt, that, that, that in a culture that drowns out the voice of Christ and drowns out the word of God. And, 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 and man, even as I was just talking moments ago about, about um, following the Lord and surrendering and, and supporting the work of ministry with tithes, even though we're not under an Old Testament law, we understand that. If you've been here for a while, you understand that. We're not not under that. We're under grace giving. But we're just talking about a starting point. And some of you are amazing. They they just go and blow it out of the, you know, just blow it out of the water with your surrender to the Lord. And others of you are very selfish and greedy. Watch, hear me out. The core message of Christianity is, is will I surrender to God all of my life? 
The message that came back here this morning in the Bible study that I was giving to the leaders of the churches is that this fellowship and the body of Christ, Big C, around the globe has a heart issue. And that heart issue is being willing to surrender to God, to go all out or to become all in for Jesus. And if you've lost that passion through fear, through anxiety, through frustration, through disillusionment, through COVID, whatever it is, I want to let you know that this morning that the, the Spirit of God calls out to you, and the Word of God has not changed. It is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and it's not going to change. He's an anchor of our soul, Hebrews tells us. And, 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 and the rock of who Jesus is has stepped out of heaven, has come down here to earth, and to you and I, we get an opportunity to receive, to embrace, and we have a choice. Will we follow or will we not? And all of this thing that we're dealing with here today is, is, is looking at this, man, and, and, and getting rid of that corruption that's within our life. So here's what our text says. Here's what James says. Take a look in your Bible, picking up, uh, again, James 11. <laughs> that's not right. James 4, verse 11, and uh, we'll start there. He says this. He says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. Ladies, you're included in that. He says, if you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Look here. You who say today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and we will do this or we will do that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own plans. And all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then and not do it. So if you know the right thing to do and you're not doing it, I want to let you know what's going on according to what James says is that it's sin. And if there's areas within your life that you know that oh, it's like, oh man, I'm just completely living in disobedience to that particular area and you know it, then there's an expectation of a change of direction. There's an expectation for you to look to the Lord to confess your sins. Why? 1 John chapter 2 tells us that Jesus is the advocate. He's our advocate with the Father when we sin. It's his righteousness, not our righteousness, but it's our obedience that's calling into question. And that obedience is nothing more than surrendering to the call, the leading, the direction of God's word by his Holy Spirit in our individual lives. That we are to follow the Lord and we are to obey. And many times the struggle that comes forward with obedience is because we've turned a deaf ear to God because of condemnation. And rather than, rather than bringing to the foot of the cross in our time of prayer and saying, God, I'm really struggling with this, man. And confessing what the, what the wrestle is and then leaving it there at the foot of the cross and going out and living by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Re remember with me, and this is not in my notes and I'm sorry, a sound booth here. Uh, but, but remember with me in, in, in Galatians, uh, I believe it's 5 and 16, that, that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. If, if, if I'm a believer, grabbing a hold of everything that God has offered to me, not only forgiveness by His grace, I receive that by faith, but the empowering of His Holy Spirit to live the Christian life successfully, if I grab hold of that, it doesn't mean that I become a perfect person, but what it means is that I become a person that is empowered to overcome those particular areas of weakness within my life. And the spiritual battle navigates through there as to where I wrestle with, as James already told us here at the end of chapter one, that temptation that Satan likes to bring our way. The temptation where he seduces a weakness within us to pull us in this direction or that direction. Many of you perhaps are staying in an infantile state or stuck in a spot in your relationship with God because you won't sacrifice, you won't surrender, I should say. You won't come to the place of bringing that issue, whatever it is, I don't care what it is, it doesn't matter how egregious it is or how well, small you may think it is, but you're not taking that issue and leaving it there at the foot of the cross and then going out and saying, God, I'm going to obey. 
That doesn't mean that you will live a perfect life. Why? Because you're still, you still have a, a humanness that is attached to you. But the more that you resist Satan, the Bible says that if you resist Satan, he'll flee from you. That's what the Bible declares. So there's victory that is in Christ. There's victory. You know, we're, we're very quick at, 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 at regurgitating this truth. We should know the truth and the truth shall set us free. Well, why don't we live that truth then? And the truth is, is that God says that if we resist Satan, that he'll flee from us. That God desires for us to draw close. That God tells us this, that if I regard iniquity within my heart, guess what? The Lord won't hear my prayers. If I'm taking delight in sin and I'm, and I'm planting my feet in the ground and I'm being totally resistant to the Lord, you know, like, you know, we get that, we get that cartoon picture of a guy trying to pull, pull a donkey. His feet are stuck in the ground. Oh, you know, and he's, that's a terrible donkey noise there. But he's trying to, you know, he's trying to pull a donkey in the wrong direction. We don't want to be Christians like that, man. We want to respond to God. And if you're here struggling this morning, I don't care what your sin is. I don't care. The Bible doesn't care. God just wants you to be honest. He wants you to lay it down and overcoming our corruption. There's two things that we're to understand from this text. Two things, very simple. Number one, or A, is critical conversations. They don't produce obedience. And then B, self-confident plans are not the way of faith. Two things. If, if, if you need it reduced down to two little single sentences, those are it. That's what we're to understand about this text. Critical conversations don't produce obedience. And self-confident plans are not the way of faith. Now, here's two additional ways, or two ways, I should say, that we can think about this. I did number one is my conversations. Proverbs 18 and 21, you'll see it on the screen here, maybe. Uh, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, to my charismatic friends, that does not mean that, well, I, you know, I, be careful what I say. I'm sick. Oh, I got to speak life. No, that's stupid and that's foolish. You don't have the ability to do that. But we do have the ability to build people up or to pull them down, and that's the idea. With the words that we use, we can either encourage people or we can drag them down. By, very simply, by what we do with the language that we speak. And what, 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 what James wants us to have here and what he wants us to understand is that our conversations, man, they need to be conversations that are edifying and, and, and not conversations to where I am unjustly criticizing somebody else. Jesus said it this way. He says, the Father has commanded me what to say and how to say it, John 12 and 49. Did you get that? That Jesus himself said, listen, the Father commanded me what to say and how to say it. Now, we may have the right thing to say in times and in seasons, and we may have a great word and all of that stuff, but it's how we say it that becomes our, uh, oh, it, it, it becomes one of those things that just sinks our sailing boat. Man, I've been so guilty of that. I'm one of those guys, right? I mean, you guys know that, 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 that I spent, you know, right at seven years in that law enforcement community as a young 20-year-old dude, and so much of my emotional, my mental development of, of young adulthood is shaped around that law enforcement side. I got a good word for you, but it often comes out like one of those things was, dude, you just cut off my leg, and now my artery is bleeding, and I'm going to die. Listen, Jesus said, the Father commanded him in what to say, and watch how to say it. That's for us too, gang. It's a truth for all Christians. And we need to grow, and we need to develop in this area of what is called, what our, what our culture calls emotional intelligence. How so? By not speaking evil against other people. Now, now, what James is talking about here right now, he's dealing with the family of faith. And <laughs> uh, by show of hands, who is excited right now to learn about patience in your own individual lives? Not from the study we're doing right now, but in your own individual lives. We got a couple people that are awesome and on fire Christians. May God bless you with patience this week, and we're going to look to you next week and see how it goes. <laughs> okay, there's one of those books that's like, God, I'm so excited to teach this particular book, but not so much this book. It's like Job, right? It's that book of Job. When pastors go through and they teach the book of Job, and, and we've done the suffering chapters around here. We did them early on to get them out of the way. <laughs> but, but it's like God teaches you whatever that deal is, whatever the topic is that you happen to be upon. <laughs> And as a fellowship, he has us in this place of learning, chapter 4, 
about all these particular things about what we're to say and how we're to say it and, and about our conversations is what we're looking at today. Here's why I bring that up and here's why I laugh to it to about a degree because about the past 10 days, it has been a stinking nightmare around here with the complaints that are coming in by way of email. And, the, and, and I should say this, some get to me, but others get to the other leaders within there, but they're about me. And so I get a chance to go, oh, God, you, this message is for real. And so whether you've already put it in an email or you've whispered it to your spouse or you've thought it within your heart, please understand that this message is, is very real and timely. And now maybe your complaints and your frustration are not against me. Maybe it's some, against somebody else. But the conversation of you as a Christian, God sees it. He knows what's going on. And the motivation of the heart, the disposition of the heart is what we're dealing with. And what he's calling out here is, 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 is this area about fault finding that destroys others. You remember that Jesus put it this way. Matthew chapter seven, verse three, Jesus said it this way on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, he says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Well, that's a weird visual picture, but if we understand what he's talking about, he's merely just saying, Jesus is just saying, he says, why are you wrestling over the fault of your brother, which is a smaller fault, when you've got the same big glaring issue within your own life? What? It's not that God doesn't want us to help, want, want us as the body of Christ to help each other, but rather it is, is that don't be a hypocritical idiot because, because you're standing in this place to where you're just completely blowing it, and yet you want to go and you want to criticize somebody else of a much smaller fault, and you want to deride them and derail them and make all these demeaning and derogatory ways, and, and, and man, you just want to cut the legs off of somebody else. Oh, they got to hear this. They, don't they know better? They're a, they're, a, they're a leader within the church, or, or he's my boss, or he's, you know, they're a part of my family. You know what? I don't care the situation is you describe, but understand the issue. That for a Christian, that we are not to move to that particular place to fault finding that destroys others. It's a smaller fault. Now, I want to make sure that we get a balanced approach with this, and so it's, it's time for a little bit of Bible Olympics. So do me a favor here this morning. Wednesday night is amazing about this. Take your Bible, raise that sucker up in the air. Even if it's electronic, I want to see that you're with me and you're paying attention. Okay, man, that is a great 90 plus percent of the room. Amen. So um, uh, the, these verses perhaps will be on the screen. But if you have a Bible, and you can see your Bible, I should say. <laughs> if not, take a look at the screen. But we're going to flip over here to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to take a look at something. Because, we, again, we want a balanced perspective of what we're looking at. We want to make sure that we understand the full spectrum of what God is laying before us. And in that full spectrum, we'll start here. One side is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 down through 31. I'll read from the NLT. Here's what he says. He says, do not use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. By show of hands, who's a perfect individual within this sanctuary? Are you perfect? Nope, none of us are perfect. And so as we go forward and we look at this balanced approach and we understand that our words, our conversation, the things that come out of our mouth, it reflects the condition of our heart. You know, one of the reasons why we want to be sensitive to this and we want to yield to the Lord is because he's point blank. As an early Christian, I, had, I, I didn't know how to answer this to other people. You know, the Bible doesn't ever say that you can't cuss and do this stuff. Listen, the Bible does a directly address that, okay? Here it is for those of you that are in that spectrum or wanting to know about that. Verse, again, Ephesians 4 and 29, do not use foul or abusive language. That's the deal right there. Don't do it. So if you're wrestling with your mouth, please understand that here's a wonderful area here to surrender to the Lord and watch God do the work. And we don't want to take that mouth and we don't want to turn that mouth against others within the body of Christ. Why? Well, because what happens with our words and our actions that spill out of the motivation of our heart, what, 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 what James is dealing with is that, listen, this is how you live an authentic Christian life at the crossroads of a very corrupt culture. This is what it looks like. 
And he says that if you're, if you're living in this way and these are the things that are coming out of you, then you grieve the Holy Spirit because you're becoming abusive to others. And, and, and so if you think that your words don't matter, your words matter. For the Christian, your words matter because it goes all the way down to this place to where it grieves the Holy Spirit. Now, if we can look on the other hand, you, perhaps you would, would flip ahead to uh, 1 Thessalonians. Let's take a different look at this for just a second regarding some words. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, we too have, uh, we've also studied this uh, passage of scripture here, this book, I should say, in days gone by. But in uh, uh, chapter 5, verse number 19 down through 22, he says this. He says, uh, Paul writing, he says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. And so he gives, us a, a, he gives us a very clear word here. This is all about quenching the Holy Spirit. It's about stifling God's influence. How do we do that? By rejecting the word of God over our lives. Did you hear that? That the grieving of the Holy Spirit or what we saw within, uh, within Ephesians is, is about us becoming abusive towards others. But when we move to that spot to where we quench the Holy Spirit, again, we're looking at, we're trying to look at a balanced perspective here, two sides, okay, that, 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 that here in this text, it's about quenching or, or stifling God's influence, and we stifle that by rejecting the word of God over our lives. That is something that stifles, stifles a forward progress. Now, if you're a Christian here this morning or you're watching online, wherever you're picking up this, this, this message, maybe it's even on the radio, Listen, that if you are not allowing God's word to have its work within your life, then please realize that you're quenching and stifling the work of God's Holy Spirit. As, as, as James already said within this chapter that we're studying, is that to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And, 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 and now God's not going to throw you in the trash can because you're in a place of sin, but God wants you to acknowledge the sin. He wants you to bring it to him so that you can receive forgiveness in Jesus, and he wants you to walk forward by the power of his Holy Spirit, that your life would be changed by the word of God. That as Paul tells us in the book of Romans, that our minds would be transformed simply by knowing the truth. Changed. The Old Testament would tell us, I believe it's Hosea 4 and 6, that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Two things in the Hebrew, being ignorant and unaware. Ignorant and unaware. My people are destroyed for being ignorant and unaware. God's people, the church even in 2020, is stifled in going forward when we're ignorant of what God has said, when we're unaware of an area, and it becomes sin, and we don't even know that we're in a place of sin. Thus the necessity for us personally to be in the word. Thus the necessity for us to weekly assemble, not gather. Gather is a carnal thing. I've taught you that before. We are, according to, uh, to Hebrews uh, 10 and, and 25, that we are to assemble. We gather together on a consistent week-by-week -week basis to take form and fashion. We learn and we serve and we grow. Done. Thank you for whoever said amen. Now, think about this. Now, maybe a friend gives you a tough word, and they bring that tough word in gentleness and respect. Okay? But when they brought you God's word, all of a sudden you move to this place to where you trip out and you want to argue about it. That's an example of stifling God's influence on your life. What does the Bible tell us about the wounds of a friend? I heard somebody over here say they can be trusted. Amen. What does the Bible tell us about the kisses of an enemy? You guys remember that out of Proverbs when we studied that? The, the kisses of the enemy are deceitful. Right in the same section of verse. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful, but the wounds of a friend are faithful. There are people that God has placed within your life to speak words of healing to you. And you know what? It collides. Sometimes when God do, does that, it collides with the direction that you're walking out. But the reason that God is, is, is placed that there and a the reason that we have close relationships and fellowship and all of these things and people that are, are close to our life is so that we can receive in a very practical, regular relationship, skin on skin type of way. And as God speaks these things into our life, we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We don't want to stifle what God is up to. We don't want to go off and to go off on a friend that is just trying to look out for us. 
And so the language of faith, it should be expressed in two ways. Number one is by building up other people. Did you catch that? Write it down if you didn't. That the language of faith is by building up other people. And then secondly, is by our confidence in God's word. This is it. These, these are the expressions, one area of expressions of faith. Consider somebody with me for a minute. Consider Job for just a moment. Hmm, Job, what an awesome guy. But this was a dude that was going through a season of sifting. That God brought this guy to this particular spot. That God wanted to do something. And he brought him to this place of sifting. Much like what we see within the uh, uh, Gospel of, of, of Luke in 22. That, that we find there that Satan asked to sift Peter. That Satan asked to sift the disciples. And it's so interesting about what that looks like. Because it literally means to bring somebody to the brink of their faith. To where it's about ready to collapse. But that's a normal part of Christian growth. That what God does and what God allows us to do at different seasons and times is that, that he breaks on us. He tests us. He brings us to this place to where he allows Satan to, to, to sift us. To see what quality of faith that we have. And Job was in this spot and three areas of his life was, was touched. And I want to give you these things because you can count on this. That, that when you're going through a sifting time, you can, you can look to the word and to realize, well, it's happened in the past and, 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 and God's going to use it again in the future. Three areas, and that is number one, is that Job, his finances, his finances were tested. How so? Because his business collapsed. It was an agrarian culture. The agricultural side of, of, uh, of, of, of both ranching and farming, both of that. His animals were killed. We also see that quickly following behind that in the same chapter, chapter one of Job, that, that his family, that this was an area where, where God allowed Satan to touch it. His family went in and, and guess what? His kids were all cared for, but, but a tragic thing happened. He lost all of his kids in one day. He lost his business, you know, the finances. He lost his kids, everything. And then what else do we see happening in Job's life here? Again, these first couple of chapters of Job, we find that Job goes to this place here to where his health, it became a daily struggle. You know, we may not all go to the degree of which Job goes to, but I love to hang on to the, the, the initials of this, F-F-H. Finances, family, and health. That when you begin to touch these areas around our life, it's, it's, it's like this is the area where we want to go and we just want to hang on. And the sifting that God wants to do is he wants to walk us out so that, that we, we realize that it's like, Lord, I'm protecting my life. He wants you to know that you can trust the Lord with open hands, that you can trust the Lord to put out and to put in or to take out and to put in because God's watching over your life. If it's good for you, then he's gonna allow it to be and if it's bad for you, he wants to take it out. But many times we don't even recognize that how bad something is for us. We don't realize that how bad a particular relationship or a particular job or a particular habit is upon our soul. And we just continue to remain in this spot. And when God brings those times of, of sifting, those times of testing, he wants to heat things up within our life so that we take our hands off of it and we release it to him. But I want to make sure that I'm pointing you in the right direction here because what we're looking at here in James is all about the conversation. It's our conversation. And what did Job do? Job continued to use the language of faith even during the time of sifting. His confidence was unshakable in God's word. Take a look at the screen, Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job had an eternal perspective here and it shows up this way. He says, and naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Did you see that language of faith? That he had an eternal perspective, and he realized, because he knew who God was, he didn't blame God. Second thing, Job 13 and 15. Man, this one is powerful, and I've used this many times in my life. This is an incredible verse. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him, that Job was walking in righteousness, and he realized that even, even though God took him to a place of stripping him down, he realized that he was to be submissive to God's will, even when he didn't understand, even when he didn't have all the pieces. And then the final thing is this, Job 23 and 12, one more time on the screen, 
says this. He says, I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than, the necessary, more than my necessary food. Now, if we're not careful, that verse could be one of those verses where it's like, oh, I'm just not as righteous as Job, but we can start feeling all condemned. Well, I got to get this Bible study in here before I eat in the morning. Maybe, maybe for some of you, it's good to do that. But maybe you're so, you're so strung on the timing of this particular verse and you create a law and a weight and it condemns you as opposed to realizing it's just teaching a simple truth. And that is nothing more than this, is that Job found strength in God's word. May you find strength in God's word. May you realize that the language of faith that Job spoke, even in those times of sifting, is the same thing that you and I can do, that we can speak the language of faith. And our conversations are completely changed. Why? Because we have an eternal perspective. Why? Because we have the, the light of God's word. Why? Because we have the power of Holy Spirit living within us. Why? Because we've been forgiven of our sins. We're no longer under this gospel of works. If it's a gospel of works, then it's not of grace. If you're grading yourself on how well you perform and, 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 and how obedient you are, then guess what? You're in that place where you're keeping track of things and to where you're trying to earn something before God. Listen, you can't afford grace. You're never gonna live up to it. But you can receive it by faith. And you can walk in obedience. And God has provided the way. So here's the lesson for living here for us. Whether we're talking to or we're talking about other Christians, a simple thing, we've taught this to your kids here, if you have youth that are here with us, we, we've taught this to your kids many times. I think a time or two I've told it to the sanctuary here. But we need to think about our words first. It's an acronym. And I think they, they, perhaps they have them to throw them all up on the screen. You do. Throw them all up there here in one and I'll read through them because some people may want to write them down. I don't know. But here they are. When we're talking to or we're talking about other Christians, here's the deal. We need to think. Listen, are the words that we're speaking, are they true words? Are these in fact a reality or is this just something that's hearsay? Is this just, you know, some sort of a hunch? Are, are the words that I'm speaking, are they helpful? Listen, because you may have words that are true, but they may not be helpful. God may reveal something to you that might be true, but guess what? It is for nobody else. And you can't just rattle this stuff off and throw it out there. Are the words that we're going to speak, are they important? Again, maybe along the same vein as that last one. Hey, these things might be true and they're, well, maybe there's something that's helpful. From my vantage point, this is helpful. I would want somebody to tell me this. But maybe they're not important in that other person's life at that particular moment. Are the words necessary? That becomes a little bit more of a tougher thing because I, I, I tell you, it seems like, you know, last night I was having a conversation with somebody from this fellowship <clears throat> And, 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 and they've been wrestling, and, and I think it was more of a counseling situation that I've given to them, that they were wrestling with how to address some particular issues that they see a friend in this, in this fellowship going in the wrong direction. And it's just like this slow fade thing that's happening. And the person is, is completely blind or, or stubborn to it. Listen, necessary words are, are, are these words that save other people from hardships because of a bad decision. Did you catch that? The necessary words. These are the, these are the tough words that save other people from hardships and bad decisions. And, and, and guess what, gang? Galatians chapter six, I believe it's verse number one, that, that it says, you who are spiritual. Listen, if you see a brother or a sister that's caught in sin, it is your responsibility to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness. You are to speak to those things. Now, moms and dads, parents, I should say, this doesn't mean that you go and you unleash yourself on your adult kids and you start blah, 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 blah. Nope, stop that. Mm, doesn't go that way. That would, we need to apply this. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it important? Maybe not. But when you're seeing somebody in a place of hardship and bad decisions, and, and, and because of the bad decisions, I should say that the hardship is growing and the person is blind to it, that becomes one of those necessary things that you need to speak to. But you need to do it in a kind way. Does that make sense? All right, let's, 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 um, uh, have I lost you or shell-shocked you today? Because some of you guys are sitting there looking at me like, I don't know how to deal with this. I feel like he's speaking directly to the issues within my life, and I'm not sure how to digest this. So here's what we're going to do. Take your little hands and go like this. Come on. All right, you feel better now. <laughs> See? It was a very simple thing to shake it off. <laughs> 
Second idea, and this will go very rapidly, my plans. So this is the, uh, remember as we're going through this, we're just talking about ways that we can think about what James has, has given to us here. What James has put before us as practical Christian living in the crossroads of culture, all of these biblical truths that we can apply to how we live the Christian life. Something very simple. My plans. Now, perhaps, perhaps you will remember with me, early on in the uh, uh, COVID pandemic, that we were in this place to where we went and we looked at Ruth. And as we went through Ruth, we saw that there was the, the characters in, in chapter one, verse number one, we saw Elimelech and we saw Naomi. And we saw that these guys are examples of people that are running. When the circumstances got tough within their life and around their city and in their community and the stuff that they were wrestling with, what did they do? Well, they left Bethlehem. And we learned that Bethlehem is, is known as the house of bread. And where did these guys go? Well, it was a husband and wife idea that it's like, okay, this famine is here. This hardship is here. I'm getting out of here. These things are changing within old Bethlehem. This doesn't look good. I'm out of here. And they bolted. And they went south and east. And they went to Moab. And, 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 and we've learned by looking at the, at, the, at the scriptures that Moab is referred to as God's toilet bowl. What a tasty treat of leaving the house of bread and going to the toilet bowl. That's not a good maneuver, right? Would you agree with that, that that's not a good maneuver? You should, yeah, you shouldn't leave the house of bread and go in that direction. And so rather than living by faith, what did they do? They made plans that seemed to be right. I do believe that we have a proverb, Proverbs 16, 25. Take a look at this on the screen right here. It's amazing. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. Hmm. That we can get these harebrained ideas that this is a good thing that I'm doing. Oh, I feel God leading me in this. All right, great for you. And I'm so sorry that you're stuck in a place right now to where you're being blinded by the truths of God. And this is what Elimelech and Naomi did. This is what we find in the opening chapter of the book of Ruth that teaches us about the struggles that go on. That rather than staying put and our, firm, our feet firmly affixed in the house of God, this place, house of bread, then we move and we settle for something that is much less. And you'll remember with me that as we, as we look to what happened in the book of Ruth, that those consequences did not fall immediately. It was 10 years plus before all of that happened, before all the wheels came off of it. What does that tell us? It tells us that, that, it, that in real time, that the decisions that I make in any given moment, that there's a consequence that is attached to that decision. If I'm making a decision of faith, that it's going to, it's going to produce a crop of faith, right? If I, if I, on the other hand, if I sow to the flesh, the Bible declares to you and I that we will reap the whirlwind. This is an example of what these guys did. And what happened? It cost them dearly. Why? Because they had to suffer. Because there was a death in a marriage and there was death of kids and all of this particular stuff that spilled out. We know that. She lost both of her sons and her husband. Now, 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 now maybe the bad decisions are not happening to you in the, in the same capacity here, but maybe you're experiencing a death in your marriage. Maybe you're experiencing a death in relationships. Maybe, maybe you're experiencing that your kids have just gone off the rails. Have you ever thought, have you ever considered, maybe it's all about the decisions that you made in times gone by? What's the remedy to get through that? It's always repentance, a change of direction. Always. But you have to be patient as you walk out the change of direction. Because while, while God initiates something in a moment and we respond to him, healing often goes through seasons. Listen, you, you spent, you know, in, in my case, when I got saved, I spent 21 good years of screwing up my life. I was awesome at doing that. I wrecked it. I, you know what? I got saved, and amen, I was saved. I went from pursuing death to being welcomed into the family of faith, and God made me a new creation. But learning the habits, learning what he said, learning to walk by faith, listen, this is an ongoing thing. I'm 28, almost 29 years into walking things out. And some days I trip myself out. I'm going, how in the world are you still struggling with that? 
That's just like Christianity 101, knucklehead. Get it together. Isn't that true in your life as well? Those, those things that you see there, it's like, Lord, I want to encourage you and I want to make sure that you understand that when you're arranging your life to walk by faith in the Lord, that God's going to walk with you step by step. Take a look at the screen, Hebrews 11, verses 8 and 9. Here's what it says in Hebrews. He says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave, to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land that God had promised him, he lived there by faith. He was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob who inherited the same promise. It's a walk of faith that never stops. It just doesn't stop. It was good for Abraham. It was good for his kids. They lived in that promise. And a life of faith unfolds step by step. Now, I've had some more recent critics that have popped up. And if you're watching here this morning, perhaps this portion of the message is for you very particularly. And I just highly suspect that you are watching. That you've been heavily critical of me of giving some particular biblical truth in counsel in, in, in some regards about family matters and destructive and harmful behavior. And I want to speak to all of you on this. That God called Abraham out from his family to a life of faith. God did that work, that's the call that God made. In the New Testament, we find in Ephesians chapter 4 that there are, uh, the Apostle Paul given the instruction on how it is, is that we are learned how to walk. And he encourages us to leave the toxic relationships behind. He also tells us, he says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Amos tells us, can two walk together lest they be agreed? Jesus speaks, he says, hey, a house divided cannot stand. Here's the point, please don't miss it. There are those seasons and there are moments as believers in Jesus Christ because of what God is up to that we have to step off of toxic relationships up to and including getting away from family members for a particular time. And maybe that is so that God can grow deeper roots within our life so that we can stand in a place where we could be a help and that we don't compromise within our own life. God has created the family institution and the family unit. And if you've, been here, if you've been here through the course of the year, you know that I heavily support Mother's Day and Father's Day. Honor the institutions that God has put in place. It's a biblical truth. But it does not mean that as an adult person that you surrender to the corrupting practices of a parent. You're out from underneath of that. And we need to be able to discern what the Spirit would tell us in any given moment as to how to navigate through that. Psalm 119.105. Uh, let's take a look at it in NLT. I have a New King James memorized, but here it is in NLT. He says that your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. I think we can digest that. I think that we can understand that. Listen, uh, what am I supposed to do? I'm to submit to biblical truth for the leadership of my life. Second thing is this, Proverbs 11, uh, verse number 14. This is New King James. Let's take a look at this. He says, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Man, there is so much to unpackage in that particular verse It'd be because of the amazing transformative work that is in that. And I would encourage you that if you need more of that understanding, that you would get our study on Proverbs 11 and that you would look at that. But the idea is, is just nothing more than getting the counsel of others because sometimes other people can see something that we've become blinded to. And maybe it is our own motivation that has blinded us to our situations. Here's the point. As we, as we begin to, to, to wrap this up, here's the point. If when I walk within self-confidence, it wrestles the reins of God's leadership right out of his hands and I take them into my own hands. When I begin to go to that place to where I demand my way and I want it right now, I'm no different than what the children of Israel wrestled with on the Exodus in Numbers chapter 11. Where, 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 where they came to that place and they were so huffy and puffy. It's like, we want quail now. We want meat now. 
And you know, because of the, 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 the thrust that was within them, God said, you're going to have some quail. You're going to eat quail for the next 30 days. Boy, you're going to be living it up good. And God gave them what they wanted. And after day 30, they died. All of them. And you know what? The spiritual lesson that we take away from that here for New Testament times, the times that you and I are living in, is that we don't want to go to the place to where I pound my feet saying, give me quail. Give me my way now. Because it will lead to death. Spiritual death. A death of a relationship. I can no longer hear God's voice. I don't longer have people in my life that I can trust. That we become so obstinate and so just buried down within our way. That I'm ready to do whatever it takes to satisfy my physical, mental, and emotional cravings to the neglect of spiritual principles. And I'm going to leave you with this one truth. And this is one truth, unfortunately, that we need to do a better job around here. And let me retract that phrase because that could come out to some as feeling hard and heavy. This is one truth that I want to I want to make sure that I'm prompting your ears to the word of God on. In Titus chapter 2, it's a fault that it, 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 it's a weakness that happens often around here especially in a day and age like 2020. By show of hands, how many women do I have in this room? Just raise up your hands. I'm not going to count you. I'm just going to look to make sure you're identifying in the right zone. <laughs> Some things just happen. I didn't even mean for that, and then I realized what that was all about. Okay, you put your hands down. God bless you guys, okay? Uh, ladies, I'm not picking on you, uh, uh, but I am instructing you with godly counsel here, and I need you to grab hold of this. Well, I, I would encourage you to grab hold of it. Let me rephrase that. You're going to do what you're going to do. But I'm encouraging you in the ways of righteousness, and I'm encouraging you in a culture that is so bent against the home, against the traditional family, and against the fabric of framework of the built-in protections that God has set. They're built-in protections from the Lord. And our culture says to you ladies, you young ladies in particular, get out there, you work, you do your thing, and do, get in advance, advance, advance. Amen and praise the Lord in its right time. Second Timothy, excuse me, uh, Titus chapter 2. Looking down here, verse number four and five, it says this. Actually, I'm going to go back up to verse number three. It says, the older women. I don't think I have any old women in this place, but I, the older women. Likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. And then there's a dash. Not a hyphen, a dash. That means that there's, this is a parenthetical. He's giving us additional information. And here's what he says that the older women are to do this, that they admonish the younger women to do what? To love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, to be chaste, to be homemakers, to be good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. That's New King James. Uh, can you throw it on the screen, NLT, on this, for, for chance? Okay. Uh, Titus 2. Here, take a look here. These older women must, must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. If you're a mommy and you have kids, I want to tell you this, that the number one fatal flaw to raising God's godly children is when those babies are at home and you're not. Now, that culturally doesn't go over well. Well, who are you to say this and that? I'm not anybody to say this and that, but I am here to tell you that, that as, as Paul gave it to Titus in the pastoral epistles to teach the church, that it is the pastor's responsibility to speak to those things that are culturally different and that are biblically approved. And the biblical way that this goes down is, is that if you have a baby at home, a young child, I'm just calling it generically baby, then you, mommy, need to be the number one caretaker of that baby. Not dad. We live in a world where there's daddy dudes that put the pajamas on every single day and there's no course of change. Listen, I'm not talking about a temporary little blip in the, in the process of going through a career change or, 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 or greater education or, or, or goodness gracious, I got laid off, I got fired or whatever, whatever. I'm not talking about that. 
What I'm talking about is a strategy here to where daddy surrenders the leadership of the home and he gives it to mommy and mommy's so excited to take that and guess what? Mommy has a young child at home, a school-aged child, and mommy is not the caretaker. It goes to family members, it goes to daycare, it goes here, it goes there. You know, sometimes with daddy, listen, daddy sucked at being dads. They're not daddy daycare dudes and I know we have movies like that. But daddies get distracted. Not that mommies don't, but mommies are better at multitasking. So what am I doing? I'm propping up women. I'm saying that you have a skill way better than your husband. Way better. And doesn't, that doesn't neglect or, or release him from responsibility, for he's the head of the home. But it does set the order in place. And so many people take the priorities of life, the biblical priorities. Well, 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 I heard God say this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. It's like, mm, that's one of those things where you need to think. Is this one of those things that is necessary? It's necessary. Address it, deal with it, and, and, and look to God to intervene and to help because our kids, our kids are suffering. And what we want to do around here is we want to encourage you to move forward in the faith by engaging the gospel of Jesus Christ in all areas of your life. We don't want you to talk all this spiritual stuff and have this great whatever, whatever, but when your feet hit the ground, you went... You went this way. No, no, no. We want, you to, we want you to be the same person. We want you to engage Jesus right here to receive from him. And when you go home, you stay engaged with Jesus. You walk these truths out within your life. And then that, that spills out into public. Your home has changed. Your heart has changed. Your home has changed. And your community has changed. But because Christians, well, that's just an old antiquated way of looking at this and that, we push it off. And we go down. And then we end up in it with a world or, or a country in which we're in in 2020. Kids don't even know what they are. You know, this boy wakes up, he thinks he's a girl from Africa. What? What? Uh, I know that sounds strange, but those are like real things, right? Or we get the dude that's 50 years old. Well, I'm a dog now. I'm a German shepherd. Well, you're a hairy guy that probably should shave your back, but stop. All right, we got now. We're getting out of bounds. <laughs> oh, God help us. Let's get the worship team to come back forward. I think you can see the hyperbole in that, okay? But I also, but I, also I, I don't want to minimize the reality of this sinful process there, okay? Please see that. And man, our, our aim around here is to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. The people will be set free. They wouldn't be living in a place of condemnation, but that you would understand what God called you to do and that you'd walk in the light of his word. And let him bless you all the time. This is a step-by-step -step process. Can you stand with me for a little prayer? Thanks for joining us today. If you want to know more about having a real relationship with God, click the Do You Know Him link at westminstercalvary.org. We invite you to join us for our regular worship services on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are conveniently located on the northeast corner of Wadsworth Parkway and Church Ranch Boulevard in the Stanley Lake Marketplace Shopping Center. For more information, please contact our church offices at 303-223-4640. Thanks and God bless. His kingdom within us, a heaven is hidden in our hearts. You're in our hearts. You're in our hearts. You've broken our hearts. Free and simple. Oh